All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now remember, when Paul says, follow me, he doesn't mean follow me as a man. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. That's the way you should do me. You should follow me, but follow me as I follow Christ. Listen to me, but listen to me as I, as I listen to Christ. So you can have any confidence in me, but you sure can't have confidence in Christ, can't you? And uh, it goes on to say in verse 2, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I deliver them unto you. So if you underline in your Bible, you might want to underline that the phrase, keep the ordinances, actually it's the clause. Uh, keep the ordinances. The subject of that clause is you. You keep the ordinances. And uh, so we're going to talk today about the Lord's Supper. Now that we've read our text, go all the way back over to Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to deal with uh, those verses that we uh, concluded with last week. And we're going to continue on with them. But I'm going to uh, <clears throat> say a few things before we get right into those uh, verses. Uh, last week we talked about the Passover. And during the eating of the Passover, the Lord takes the time at the end of the meal to institute what we call the Lord's Supper. Um, instructions and encouragement were given later by Paul, the apostle that the Corinth church uh, should keep the ordinances. And that's the verse we just read as he delivered them to the church. And he went in when they established churches. They always uh, established the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper is a church ordinance. And you need to remember that. It's not a Christian ordinance. It's a church ordinance. Um, and uh, should be observed within the confines of a local church. So when uh, First Baptist Church observes the Lord's uh, Supper, it should be First Baptist Church observing the Lord's Supper. Now, a lot of people have bad ideas about the Lord's Supper. They think that the Lord's Supper is a fellowship between people. And it is, as far as, as, far as the church is concerned, in a, to a sense, but that's subordinate to the main purpose. The main purpose is not to have fellowship. The main purpose is to show forth the death and the burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a church that believes in that, we do it symbolically through the Lord's Supper. Um, and so he rehearses this over in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. And if you want to turn back over there and save your place, but I'm going to read these verses, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11. I should have had you to stay there for a minute or two. Notice what he says here. For I have received of the Lord, there he's trying to give them what the Lord gave him, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And that's what we read over in uh, Matthew 26. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, <clears throat> ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, there are a lot of things said in those verses, but I, I have underlined in my notes, maybe probably in my Bible too, number one, in verse number 24, it says, do in remembrance of me. And, <clears throat> and most of the tables that are set out for the Lord's Supper have on that uh, in remembrance of me. <clears throat> And so the Lord's Supper is not about the church. The Lord's Supper is not about the pastor. The Lord's Supper is about Jesus. It's about him. And so it's supposed to point to him. And then I, I underlined there in verse 25, as off as you drink, as off as you drink it, which means there's no restriction on how often you take it. We could meet here every day if you wanted to. We could have the Lord's Supper every day as a church. It wouldn't be any problem. Now, I wouldn't want to do it, and I probably wouldn't be there. <laughs> Uh, that's a lot of the Lord's Supper, you know. And some churches take it every Sunday. Well, that's okay. I don't have any problem with taking it every Sunday. The problem is, some of the churches that do that think you have to do that to keep your salvation. And that's, that's wrong. Uh, but it says, as often you drink it. 
And so that, that refers to uh, uh, the Lord's Supper. And so we take it, we had decided to take it every fifth Sunday, which I think is good. It's regular. And uh, we know we don't have to worry about, well, when are we, are we ever going to take the Lord's Supper again? I know churches who've had divisions in their church, and they haven't taken the Lord's Supper for 15 years because they can't get rid of that division. I want you to show me a church that has no division, and I'll show you when you can stop the Lord's Supper. <laughs> uh, now, if there's a great one, you might want to do that for a little while. But, but then it says, of course, in remembrance of me. And then at the last, in verse 26, it says, You do show forth the death, his, uh, the Lord's death, till he come. Now, this shows us one thing it shows us is that we're supposed to continue on and on and on and on and on to do the Lord's Supper, never to stop taking the Lord's Supper. The next thing it shows is the perpetuity of the Lord's churches. So if we're supposed to keep it going on for year after year after year after year after year, it means that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be there because it's a church ordinance. So it's a promise of the perpetuity of the Lord's churches. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? We believe in that here. Um, now let's go over to Matthew 26 now. You're probably already there. And uh, begin reading in verse 26. Now these are the verses that I read when we have the Lord's Supper. In verse 26 it says... And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Heavenly Father, bless us now as we look into these verses that you'll bless us in knowing more about the Lord's Supper and about your death, your burial, your resurrection. And that if there's one here today who's never repented of sin and put complete faith and trust in Christ, that this would be the day that they would do that and be saved forever. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, as they were eating. Now, they were eating the Lord's Supper, the, the Passover, rather. Symbolizing the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's, uh, uh, first of all, it represented their coming out of Egypt. But it also looked forward to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But now their minds were to be redirected by the Lord Jesus as he uh, turns away from the Passover table and begins to uh, set up a symbolic supper uh, called the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. We read this last week, I think. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So he's turning his uh, attention now from the Passover of the old covenant to the Passover of the new covenant. The old covenant is the law. The new covenant is grace, okay? And uh, so we have some different uh, lessons here about the unleavened. The old leaven, here it says, purge out, therefore the old leaven. Well, that could be the old Passover, which was to be ended at this called the Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper. That was the last Passover that was ever to be done, never to do again. Don't have to do that Passover anymore. Now, some do it. Even some uh, Protestant churches and maybe even some Baptist churches uh, celebrate the Passover for some reason or other. But that's the old leaven. Now, if that's, if that's what that means. Uh, it could also mean the changing of the leavened bread uh, eaten on usual days to unleavened bread. The leavened bread would be what you eat every day and the unleavened bread would be what you eat in the Passover and also in the Lord's Supper. But most probably, I think it represents the leaven of the old life lived in the flesh. Uh, for unregenerated people who are lost, they, they don't know the Lord, not having been saved, not having their sins washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and living on uh, earth's bread instead of living on the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, no more keeping the Passover, but uh, looking more <clears throat> directly as he turns from the Passover Supper <clears throat> to the Lord's Supper, he's looking more directly at himself and what he's going to do <clears throat> on the cross of Calvary. Now, the book of Revelation, don't turn here, but Revelation 1.5 says he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so here we're looking at the bread. It says Jesus took bread, unleavened bread from the table of the Passover because that's the kind of bread they use in the Passover. Uh, but now, this bread will no longer be representing the coming out of Egypt. But this bread will now be pointing to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin 
of the world. It was also a symbol of sincerity and truth. You might want to jot this down. It may be in your notes there in your bulletin. 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, <clears throat> but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So not only are we turning away from the old leaven of the Passover to the Lord's Supper, but we're turning away from fleshly things and uh, from what he calls a leaven of malice and wickedness over to the leaven, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so that's the difference here. And then the Bible says in that verse, he goes on to say, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. Each one of those is important. He took it from the Passover supper. Because somehow the Passover supper and the Lord's supper represent the same thing. Spiritually. Now we know that the Lord's Supper does not picture the coming out of Egypt. And the Passover did. But the Passover also looked for that lamb. Remember they had to kill a lamb. And it looked forward to that lamb. And the, and the, the, the main lamb was the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He blessed it by praying to God and, and uh, being thankful uh, for that. And of course we should always be thankful. Uh, when we eat as well as when we take the Lord's Supper. And then he broke it because it represented the broken uh, body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the broken body of the Lord tells us when he suffered, you know, they whipped him and they scorched him and they did all kinds of things to him, slapped him and told him to, told him to prophesy who did it and all that kind of thing. And so his body was broken. The Bible indicates that when they got through with him, you could hardly tell he was a human being. So his body was broken. He suffered in his body. Now that was important. And it was prophesied. And, and as I've told you a number of times, that's not the suffering, though, that paid for our sin. It's part of it because he had to go through that by prophecy. But the suffering that paid for our sins was when he was on the cross in the darkness and God poured out his wrath upon his son and punished him for my sins. That was a terrible thing for God to do, wasn't it? No, it was a wonderful thing for God to do. And then he gave it to the disciples. After he did, he gave it to the disciples. And that represents Christ giving his body for a sacrifice for our sins on the cross and also represents how that God extends grace to those whom the Father has given him. I want you to turn over to John 17, and I want you to see this, and I, I think it's important or I wouldn't have you to do this. Because I don't hear this preached very much. In our day and time. In verse 9 of John 17. Jesus is praying what we call the high priestly prayer. And he says in verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. And here's what I want you to see. But for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. First of all I want you to notice that's in past tense. And I am one of them. Now, the, the important thing about being past tense is that before I was born, I was given to God, I, to Christ. I was, God get, gave Christ, gave me to Christ. And the reason I know that is because this is before I was born and it's in past tense. Those that thou hast given me. And then verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. Well, he was literally, but he's getting ready to leave. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name them whom thou hast given me, and they, that they may be one as, as we are. So who's going to heaven? Those whom God gave to Christ. Now that's important to me. Very important to me. I don't hear people talk about that very much. Verse 24 says, Father... I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Past tense. It's as if I'm already in heaven. It's, it's done. I mean, the Lord died for me. The Lord convicted me. The Lord uh, gave me faith to believe, and I believed in him, and he's keeping me, and I will be delivered to the Father. No doubt about it. This is past tense, as if it's already done. 
Now he goes on in our text in verse 26, says, this is my body. Now that's what we call a metaphor. You know this little song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let, oh, that's not a light. It's a metaphor, Sam. What's a metaphor? It means I'm using my finger for a light. This is a light. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's my little light that shines everywhere. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's not a light. Well, this is my body. When they ate that bread, that was not his body. Yes, it was. It was a metaphor. You know what I mean? You all understand that? Oh, that was not his body. And yet we have people today, some religions, that say that's when you eat that bread, it's actually the real body of Jesus. Well, I would call that cannibalism, wouldn't you? <laughs> we don't eat bodies. No, we eat bread. But it's the Lord's body. It has to be unleavened bread. And we'll speak of that in just a moment. Uh, so it, he had an unleavened body. In 1 Peter 2.22 it says, talking about Christ, it says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And if you want to put a reference there at your verse, Isaiah 53.9, this is a quote from Isaiah 53.9, And in his mouth there was no guile. And so he brought it right out from the Old Testament. Because Isaiah 53 says he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Because he did no violence, neither was guile found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Even though he was perfect, it pleased God to bruise him. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. See, that's the unleavened bread. No, it's not unleavened bread. Oh, yes, it is. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor of the sinless body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 27 and 28, we turn now to the cup. And it says in verse 27, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. So he took the cup, the same cup that's on the, uh, the, uh, the eating of the Passover and here the Last Supper. He took it to make a point and to make a symbol. It had no magical power, it had no mystical power to it. Uh, it was uh, just a symbol of Jesus' blood. And the Bible says next he gave thanks. Now, according to the writings of the... Uh, the Jews, it was their custom to pray for the food, the, what they call bread. Usually the word bread in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, it doesn't mean just bread, it means food. Uh, and so, and sometimes we use it that way in, in a general sense. But it was customary for them to thank the Lord for the food and separately to thank the Lord for the drink. And if you'll notice, when we do the Lord's Supper, we thank the Lord for the bread, and then we thank the Lord for the cup. And that's why we do it, probably, because of that, that's, well, that's the way the Lord did it. You know, he blessed the bread, and then he blessed uh, the cup. And he gave thanks, of course. Um, now, we'll notice in verse 29 that it's called the fruit of the vine. Now, I want you to know that whatever was in that cup was on the Passover, was in the Passover. And if you tell a Jew that that was something besides wine, he will laugh you out of the room because that was wine the Lord used because it was in the Lord's Supper, it was in Passover. Now, that's not the word that's used when in referencing the Lord's Supper in the Bible. The word wine is never used in reference to the Lord's Supper. The word grape juice is never used in reference to the Lord's Supper. But the fruit of the vine is. It's the only word, the phrase, that's used to describe what's in the cup. So we have spent all these years arguing over what's in the cup. 
The only ones I'll argue with is the ones that use Pepsi and Coke and milk and that kind of stuff. I think it should be the fruit of the vine, don't you? Yeah. And if a church decides they want to use wine, that's the fruit of the vine. If they want to use grape juice, that's the fruit of the vine. I don't really have any problem with that. They, they, that's up to them what they want to use in the Lord's Supper. And so it's not a matter here. He's not trying to teach us what's in the cup. We know what's in the cup. Whatever was on the Passover table was in the cup. Now, some of them say that they added water to it, and that's fine if they, if they did that. But that's, that's okay. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, but we're, we're not arguing over what's in the cup. Because if we do, we lose sight of the cup. See, what is the cup? Well, he gave it to them. It was given to the disciples, just as the bread was given to the disciples. And both symbolisms are important for the disciples to know and understand metaphorically his body and his blood. They, they needed to know both of those things. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, drink ye all of it. Most commentators believe it means all of them. Now, some people think it means to drink the whole thing which I don't know whether they did or not, because uh, if, if it's what I think it was, they had, they had a bigger cup than what we usually have, is like one sip, you know. And uh, I don't really think they would gulp the whole thing down. But it doesn't matter to me which one it is, but uh, most commentators think that it means talking about all of them. All of you take it. Drink ye all of it. All of you drink it. Not just some of you, all of you. And uh, I tried to uh, associate that with a local church, which is, will work okay, but because those men represented the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the apostles of the Lord Jesus. And he, they represented, and he said, all of you take it. And wouldn't it be wonderful if every member of First Baptist Church would be here to take the Lord's Supper at the same time? Wouldn't that be great? And when I said drink ye all of it, I meant all the members of First Baptist Church, and they'd all be here. Well, we'd have a whole house full of people. I mean, we got members that have been here. And I don't know, well, they're probably on the inactive roll now, but nonetheless, you know, we've got a lot of members. Uh, but drink ye all of it. And that's important. Now look at verse 28. Here's the metaphor. For this is my blood of the New Testament. Now how could that be his blood? He was sitting right there with them, and his blood was in his body. How could that be his blood? That couldn't be his blood. He said, this is my blood. Of the New Testament, which is shed uh, for many for the remission of sin. So we need to notice that when they took the Lord's uh, of the Passover, that was the blood of the Old Covenant. When they took the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, it was the blood of the New Covenant. It wasn't the Passover. He turned away from the Passover, which they did under the Old Covenant, but that was to be stopped. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the, that was the last Passover. So Jesus is our Passover. He's the ultimate Passover. He's the one and only Passover that could actually accomplish what the Passover symbolized, was the taking away of our sins. That's exactly what he did. Hebrews 9, 20, 26 says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So one sacrifice is all we needed. All those years they did the Passover. Every year, every year, every year, every year for hundreds of years. And then Jesus did it once and got rid of it. Because he accomplished what the Passover was picturing. Isn't that a wonderful thing that Jesus did for us? And then he says, which is shed for many. Please don't get offended at this. I'm going to show you some things. How many are the many? Well, we've just read, as many as the Father has given him. That's how many. As many as, it re, as will repent and believe in the gospel. As many as the Spirit will convict of their sins. And as many as uh, will come to him and believe in him. That they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's how many. How many? That's how many. Now, some people say... That they wonder whether when we get to heaven if there will be more people in heaven or more, more people in hell. Now, I don't really believe the Bible deals with that as such. So I don't know whether we should be actually ask that question or not. Because, you know, if you're good at math or if, you're, if you think 
mathematically, it's easy to come up with either one. A few people in heaven, a whole bunch of people in hell, or a whole lot of people in heaven, a few people in hell. Uh, so that's really not what he's dealing with here. But, but I want to read to you Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And you're familiar with these verses. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Many. Verse 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Well, does that prove that there's a few in heaven and there's a whole bunch in hell? No, it doesn't prove that. Anytime we look at our generation, any generation, it has always been that the wicked outnumber the righteous. It's always been. But when we go over to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, notice what it says. John said, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. Don't tell me there's going to be just a few in heaven. You can't even number them, there's so many. What did God promise Abraham? Your seed will be as the stars of the heavens. Did you ever try to count the stars? I have. I've been trying it for 76 years. And I've never been able to do it. And you can't count the people that are in heaven either. And I don't, he doesn't call, talk about counting the people in hell, so I, I don't know. But I want you to remember that not only the people who are living in a certain generation represent who's in heaven and hell, but we have 1,500 babies killed every day that are going to heaven. Every day. In America, 1,500 babies in the womb killed every day. Does that sound like a little bit of number? No, all those babies are going to be in heaven. And I think I can prove it. And I think all of you believe that. So where's that big number going to come from? Well, you've got imbeciles. You've got people that don't know, you know, they don't have the knowledge of sin. I don't believe that they're sent to hell. And, uh, and some other exceptions, too. So when we read about the little flock and all that, that's just a generation going through their, their number of years, you know, and the wicked seem like they're always on top and they're always the boss and they always have their way and, and the believers are just little people, you know. We've always been a little people. Baptists have always been a little people, even, even the Baptists themselves. Throughout all the generations, they've always been little people. Now, at times, they seem to flourish, you know, and... But every time they flourish, the government tried to take them in. Say, well, we'll govern under you. you you'll, be, you'll be the state church. Did you know that when America first was organized that they actually wanted the Baptists to be the state church? And guess what the Baptists said? I don't think so. We don't believe in that. We don't believe the church ought to regulate what's going on. That's the Lord's church. And so they say, we, we, think, we think there just ought to be religious freedom among everybody. And the Baptists are mostly responsible for religious freedom in America. And if you don't know that, if you don't believe that, you read your history and you'll find out that the Baptists started it, the Baptists pushed it, and it was because of letters written between Baptists that got our government to put in the, to our documents the freedom of religion. I'm glad I'm a Baptist. And I wish you were. If you weren't, well, you probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> now, the Bible also says in Matthew one twenty one, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall uh, save his people from their sin. All those people in heaven, they're his people. They've always been his people. They were his people before the foundation of the world, and they'll be his people in heaven. And I'm one of them. How do you know you're one of them? Because he convicted me of my sins, and I believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's all I need to know. And he's my Savior. Now, to close out, verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of thine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus told his disciples that he had not drink of this particular drink anymore in this life. But it will be a new day when he does that. In the Father's kingdom, there will be no earthly grapes 
There won't be any wine or grape juice. No, it'll be new wine. I don't know what it'll be like. I don't know where it'll come from. But it'll be the fruit of the vine. I will drink this fruit of the vine with you in my Father's kingdom. And it's called the fruit of the vine. Even then. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 1611, Thou will show me the path of life in the presence of uh, is, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forever. So these are the divine favors and pleasures of the Lord. This new wine is probably not wine at all. It probably is these joys and pleasures that we will receive when we get to heaven. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that. That's fine. Some, there are a lot of literalists, you know, around. And they think it'll be real wine. I don't care. It's okay with me if they believe that. But I believe it's more a symbolic thing. It's the joys and the pleasures and the confidence and the surety that we'll have in the Lord Jesus Christ when he takes us from this old wicked world and takes us to heaven to be with him. And boy, won't that be a glorious day. I'm going. I hope you're going with me. If you're not going with me, I don't know where you're going. Well, I do too. There are only two ways, two places, you know. And I uh, don't preach on it a lot, but it's called hell, and hell is not a good place. And so you, well, how can I know that I'm part of this many? Well, the only way you can know is turn from your sins, see the Lord Jesus Christ dying for your sins, going to the grave, resurrecting to justify you, coming to new life and giving you life by faith in Him, believe and trust in His work that He did on Calvary, and He'll save you right where you are. You don't have to come up here. You don't have to shake my hand. You don't have to go through the waters of baptism or take the Lord's Supper. You don't have to do anything except just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are the children of God by faith, Galatians 3.26. If you haven't trusted him, I hope you'll do that today. Let's stand together.